All right, well, good afternoon to you guys and to everyone online. Um, I want to begin uh, by praying and, and if possible, um, having a little uh, reading portion of the scripture, and then we'll just go on with the class. Um, as you could probably already notice, Dr. Alfaro is not here, and he, um, he is preaching and teaching. Uh, he has some engagements, and so he's asked me to take his place today. We will move along with some presentations, and um, I will introduce a topic that it's been actually the subject of my personal research. I'm really excited to share with you guys, um, and it's it's actually uh, the core of my research for uh, my prospectus and, and the PhD <laughs> program too. So um, I'm excited to share that with you. But of course, we'll get through all the different presentations. Having said that, uh, let's begin praying. And uh, any of you has a Bible at hand right there? All right. There you go, brother. Would you, would you keep uh, 1 Corinthians 15 open? And if you don't mind, uh, just reading from verse 20 all the way to 28 or 29. I think it's, uh, um, and then we'll just begin praying uh, first, if you all. Bow your heads for a second. Uh, mighty God, thank you so much for your mercy. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for the fact that um, our lives are in your hands, that our future lies in your hands, that our, um, nothing that we can do uh, will ever come out of, of your knowledge, out of, uh, out of your sovereignty. And ultimately, we know that as, as your children, as um, as people of God, as people that have been chosen by you uh, even before um, the foundation of the earth, uh, we can rest assured that our future is secure, that our present is secure, and um, we know, Father, that ultimately our calling will be fulfilled as we, as we follow along and pursue uh, this calling in obedience to you. We praise you. We give you glory. We're very, um, very... Uh, grateful for what you do daily with our lives, with our children, with our families, with our studies. And we're grateful for this school. We're grateful for um, the people that we come in contact with that are able to edify our lives. We praise you. And we, uh, we pray for this nation. We pray for America. We pray for the world in general. And, um, and particularly um, just following along with uh, Psalm 122, um, I want to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and the peace of Israel as well. You may bring peace among um, this people there, that they may come to embrace the Messiah. And I thank you for, uh, for all of this, and I thank you for this class that we have today. Please allow us to have a, a nourishing time, a time that will, be, uh, will prove to be a blessing to us. We praise you in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Brother Earl, if you don't mind reading uh, that portion. Yeah. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. For then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom of God, to God the Father, destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accept ex accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him that God may be all in all. Amen. Thank you. Um, quite the passage, huh? It's one of the most amazing Christological passage, uh, passages that you can think of, that you can actually grasp. Um, it's been actually perhaps the main passage uh, that uh, a theologian like uh, Jürgen Moltmann has used uh, as the basis of his project known as the Theology of Hope probably the most important book that he wrote. Um, and and it's, it's a passage that speaks to us um, in, many, in many different ways. Um, 
I particularly share with you guys that it, it excites me every time I read it because to me it's it, it provides like uh, a a line um, of time toward the future. It tells us what are we to be expecting toward the future. Today, for example, one of the presentations has to do with Jesus and the future. And if there is a passage that lays out in detail what it's to happen on specific uh, on specificity, it is that is that passage. Uh, particularly, it speaks about the resurrection of the dead, uh, Jesus being the first fruits of the resurrection. Um, I, I wrote a paper on this because there is a um, there is typology in this language uh, as well. Um, if you know about the Jewish feasts, one of the Jewish feasts, the seven Jewish feasts that are listed in Leviticus twenty three, is the feast of first fruits. And particularly, Paul is using that language to say that Jesus was the first fruits of the resurrected ones. And he did not choose that language lightly. Uh, why? Because on first fruits uh, was the day when Jesus resurrected from the dead. It was exactly the day after the Sabbath that followed Passover. As you all know, the Lord died on Passover. As he came uh, the night before, uh, celebrated with the apostles, uh, the Passover meal, and immediately after, on the next day, in the, in, uh, at noon, he, uh, he died. Uh, he was nailed to the cross, and uh, by around 3 o'clock, probably, or closer to, uh, to the evening time, he died. Now, you would think, well, but that's the next day. That's not on Passover. But well, you have to think that the Jewish day begins at nightfall, and it ends at nightfall the next day. Therefore, when they met together, at nightfall, the evening before was the Passover Eve. They celebrated together, and on the day of Passover, when the Passover lamb was being sacrificed at the temple, at 9 a.m., uh, he would have been uh, carrying the cross and brought to Calvary and eventually nailed to that cross as well. So that on the side, it's interesting also that um, he is the first fruits of the resurrected ones, but immediately after, it tells us more about uh, the outline of the future, right? It tells us that just as he uh, was raised from the dead, so we too will be raised from the dead. Uh, particularly in dispensational theology and in general, we know um, that the resurrection is not just a spiritual resurrection as some has actually, have actually tried to argue in the past. This resurrection is actually a physical resurrection, is a bodily resurrection of which Paul is speaking of. And in fact, in the context of Romans, uh, of 1 Corinthians 15, he uh, speaks broadly about the body being raised from the dead and whether or not that body will be uh, of a different essence uh, comparatively with the body that we have today. So we do have that sense there, but we also find uh, particularly toward the future and a scatological outlook, it says that Christ will reign first and will subject all of his enemies, right? That God will allow him to subject all of his enemies and that this must take place before the end when Christ himself will reign and then he will hand over the kingdom back to the Father, which is amazing. It's an awesome uh, idea and understanding that though he reigns and particularly in dispensational theology and in premillennialism in general we understand that to be a physical reign of Christ on the earth so after that physical reign taking place in the future then he hands over the kingdom to the father and then it just everything is summed up in the father and all the glory is given to the father so if we can speak of of a of a Christological passage um, in the New Testament, specifically on Pauline theology, this is one of the main passages that touches on eschatology and on Christology as well. Having said this, um, we this is the way we've done it before. So we'll have uh, the student. We have one student presently that will present up here, um, and then, uh, provided that we have enough time, we will just go on with another presentation. And immediately after that, if we have about, say, 15 or 20 minutes, I'll introduce my subject, and we'll continue on this next Thursday. All right? Um, I do want to say this. It's important 
that you guys participate, okay? Um, you may think that we don't notice, but we do notice, yeah? And uh, Dr. Alfar has been, uh, you know, is pressing on this as well. And from the syllabus, you've noticed that participation, it's, a, it's key uh, in aver averaging your, your final grade. And so I do have a pretty good recollection of who speaks and, and who doesn't speak. And so uh, please make an effort, you know, uh, whether if it's a question or uh, something that you want to contribute with, please bring it on and let's enrich the conversation as much as we can. All right. All right, brother, if you are ready, come to the front. And um, let me share your presentation here. So if you, uh, you can move it here with the arrows, all right. So brother, go ahead and introduce yourself and then your topic and go on. Uh, hello, Chris. Uh, my name is Jim Kim. Uh, today, uh, I present about, sorry. They can hear you better, yeah. Apologize for that. Yes, uh, today my uh, presentation pro uh, uh, theme is the Jesus and his ignorance. Uh, at first time when I got this uh, theme, I was, I thought it very simple question, but and I goes, <laughs> yeah, continuous study is very big subject and even it covered whole the history of systemic theology. So I was, uh, I, I, I lose my, my mind. And anyway, uh, today I came to present this topic. And the, the top, the uh, top, top, very difficult question is the Matthew 24, 36, the sentence that uh, I will read the sentence, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the son, but the father only. So Jesus said he don't know the final day. He cannot tell the exact day to his disciples. Disciples want to know about that, know about that but he just said that he, I do not know. Only the father knows it. And this raises some question about his especially his divinity. We know that <clears throat> Jesus is a man, son of man, and also he is a son of God. So how can we solve that uh, contradiction between the humanity and his divinity? So it, um, something similar or uh, similar questions uh, aroused uh, the whole uh, synoptic gospels, but especially in this verse, uh, is the main question, is the main uh, uh, sentence, I think. Uh, so I will, first I will uh, look over the scriptures. Yep. Gospel's testimony about his divinity. So I will, uh, I present the order uh, contents in the gospels. Which testify, which testifies about Christ. Um, Jesus interpreted. Uh, Jesus interpreted the meaning of his life and revealed the, his identity when he inaugurated, in, inaugurated the kingdom of God. For example, the first message of Jesus was that uh, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So. Uh, we must think about, we, first we should think about the meaning of a kingdom. Uh, kingdom is not only confined to the territory. Even the nations has, they have the territory. But the difference between 
generation and generations and kingdom is that kingdom has king. So when the kingdom come, it means that the king is coming. So when the people heard about Jesus' message, they thought about, oh, also the king is coming to us. So it, uh, it signifies something, him as king. Uh, and Jesus saw himself as bringing the age, age to come, that it had come with the kingdom, and the kingdom come with and in himself. For example, the Luke 7, Luke chapter 7, the John Baptist, John the Baptist questioned about the identity of Jesus because he was prisoned by the Herod. So Jesus answered to the disciples of John Baptist's question using the uh, Isaiah 35 and 61. Those uh, verses are related to the, the uh, final day of the uh, God's final judgment day. And Jesus caught that uh, the blind will see, uh, yeah, blind will see, and the deaf will hear. So he caught, he, how can I say, he caught uh, that verses to himself, means that uh, he is also king. And uh, the next, next thing about the uh, gospel testimony is about Jesus' uh, divinity is uh, spiritual, uh, Holy Spirit comes on him. So it's uh, visually inaugurating the messianic age. Jews knew that the coming of Messiah, Jesus knew that the coming of a messianic age would be signaled by the spiritual outpouring. We can find the verses in Joel chapter 2, verse 28. And uh, about his divinity, his relationship with God, the Father, is very powerfully exhibited in the Jesus' prayer when he used the words Abba. Uh, as I said at the bottom, the Having surveyed the contemporary Jewish literature, Jeremiah concluded that there is no analogy at all in the whole of Jewish prayer for God being addressed as Abba. So only Jesus used the word Abba when he prayed to God. Yeah. And the other testimony about his humanity and uh, his we can find it very easily through the whole of the synoptic gospels. So uh, he was born through the virgin. And he, he's called, he called himself as a son of a man. And Jesus was hungered. And he was thirst. He was tired. He just slept, wept, and he got angry. Those emotions is uh, common to the humans. We, we definitely know, know that he is human. He also is human. And during the early, early Christianity, there, there arose a lot of heresies. So uh, it was needed to uh, uh, make the uh, uh, orthodox, <laughs> orthodox, yeah, orthodox Christianity. <laughs> so um, the, I will present the, maybe the four of the council, four council represented to you, but first, the Council of Nicaea. Uh, it was called by the Emperor Constantine I, and he hoped a general council of church would solve the problem created by the Eastern Church, by the Arianism. Arianism. It's a heresy, uh, because uh, Arian of Alexandria affirmed that Christ is not divine, but a created being. Um, at that time, the Aryan party had two main points of contention going into the Council of Nicaea. Uh, they had two points. One is Jesus was not co-eternal, co and he was created from nothing. It was their opinions about Jesus. So the uh, Nicaean, Nicaean Council of Nicaea condemned them, and uh, finally they made a creed, the Nicaean creed. 
And especially we can find the identity of Christ in the Nicene Creed, especially I choose the, this verse, uh, this sentence. That is of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not created, of the same essence, uh, it is writ written homos, homosion, as the Father, through whom all things came into being, both in heaven and earth. In this sentence, the homosion, uh, you can find the meaning in the following sentences. The Son is consubstantial with the Father. So the homosius means consubstantial. The bishops were going to record that the being of the Son is identical to the being of the Father. Uh, this is the related to the homosians. Next thing is the Council of Constant, uh, Constantinople. They completed the final version of the Nicene Creed. It also condemned the teaching of a man named Apollinarius. Uh, Apollinarius erred by emphasizing the divinity of Christ. He, uh, he uh, tried to emphasize the divinity of Christ, so he uh, degraded the humility of the Christ. Apollonius taught that while all other human beings are body, soul, and spirit coexisting in a union, <laughs> but in Christ there was only the human body and soul, the divine logos, and the divine logos replaced, having displaced, displaced the human spirit. It was their uh, Apollonius opinion. So. Uh, Council of uh, Constantinople condemned them. So, yes, uh, uh, the second sentence, uh, Gregory of Nazi, uh, Nazian, Nazian just argued for that. This is a very important thing, I think, <laughs> because it is, consent, it is related to uh, sociology. For that which he, he has not assumed, he has not healed. But that which is united to his Godhead is also saved. So uh, if Jesus did not take our uh, humanity or our whole person, human being, so if did, he did not take that, our salvation is incomplete. So he must take the whole humanity of ours, like ourselves, to save ours from the sin, our sin. So Constantinople affirmed the, the, the full humility of the Son. And the next, the third council is the Council of Ephesus. Uh, this council condemned a man named Nestorius. Nestorius Nestoria, Nestorianism is the view that there are two separate persons in Christ. This is the problem, two separate persons. A human person and a divine person within a single body, they, they view that within a single body reside two persons. But the scriptures does not record any hint that the human nature of Christ acting as an independent person designed to do something contrary to the, contrary the divine nature of Christ. So the council insist, insisted that Jesus was one person, although possessing both a human nature and divine nature, so Nestorianism was rejected. The finally, the, the Council of Chalcedon, this is very important council because I think the, uh, the whole theology of the contemporary you know, um, evangelical and uh, conservative theology based on this, this, this their statement especially the Council of the Chalcedon. Uh, this council condemned a man named Eutychus. He, he held a view called monophysitism, which means one nature. Uh, Eutychus taught that the human nature of Christ was taken up and absorbed into the divine nature, so that both natures were changed. This is important. He, he claimed that both, na both human and divine natures changed. So thus a new third kind of a nature resulted. 
Uh, according to this view, Jesus was a mixture of divine and human element in which both were somewhat, somewhat modified to form one new nature. This is heresy. So the statement of the Council of Chalcedon uh, is like this one. I choose one especially very related part. The one and the only Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, if this self-same one is perfect both in deity and also in humanness. This self-same one is also actually God and actually man with a rational, rational soul and body. He is of the same reality, reality, emotion, as we are ourselves as far as his humanness is concerned. The, uh, this one and only Christ's Son, Lord, only begotten in two natures, without confusing the two natures, without transmuting one nature into other, into the other. The distinctiveness of each nature is not nullified by the union. Instead, the priority of each nature and conserved, conser conserved and both natures concur in one person and one hypostasis. So up to now, it's very um, difficult <laughs> and very uh, metaphysical notions. So anyway, this is the, uh, their statement about the identity of, identity of Jesus Christ. Uh, I added some definitions of the terms which was used in the statement considered. So uh, hypostasis, and divine nature, human nature is like this. It's a long sentence, so uh, I think you can read. <laughs> I read it. So, and another, because it is, it is important because nature and person, they uh, defined like this ones. And our theology, conservative, evangelical and conservative theology is based on these definitions. The divine person and human person. So divine person refer to the who, I, active, subjective, that subsists in the divine nature and act through its capacities. Father, the Son, and the Spirit are each a divine person. And human person refer to the who, I, active, subject, that subsists in the human nature and through its capacities. So a nature does not act, but a person acts through nature, never vice versa. In the, in the incarnation, then the person of the Son, who subsists eternally in the one divine nature, acted to assume a human nature. Yes. And, and I move to <laughs> middle, middle ages. Yeah. Um, anyway, Anyway, understanding those councils' definitions is deep, important because we can misunderstand the divinity of Christ and his humility of the Jesus Christ humility. Martin Ruth, uh, Ruth content, uh, contended that the essential incompat incompatibility of the natures the one infinite and the other finite, changing and mature, yeah, mutable, is if they are incompa incompatible. Luther contended that. So he, uh, so he felt it is necessary to argue for the communicatio ideomatum. It's, it means the communication of the properties. Uh, it's uh, between the nature, human and divine nature, the uh, property. Uh, they are communicate each other. Uh, Martin Luther uh, suggested that the idea. So, and he said that the union occurred not in the natures but in the person, one person. On the basis of the unitary person, uh, what properly belong to the humanity may be a predicate of the divinity. This is uh, those were the Martin Luther's opinions. And the next thing is. John Calvin, um, while Luther insists on the unity of 
unity of the person, Calvin was unyielding that idea, his idea. Uh, Calvin uh, rejected the integrity of the natures. For this reason, he opposed the use of the communicatio ideo matum, no conversion of humanity into divinity or divinity into humanity occurred, but it retained the properties native to them. It, it was the Martin, uh, John Calvin's idea. So Calvin, to the Calvin, he understood that uh, the Son of God descended from heaven in such a way that without leaving, without leaving heaven, he willed to be born in the virgin's womb to go about the earth and to hang up on the cross. Yet he continually filled the world at, as he had done from the beginning. This is, the, uh, this is called the Calvin's extra Calvinisticum. It is, it is major, major understanding of the Christ uh, incarnation. And the next thing is, uh, I think this is the, maybe the end of the, maybe, my presentations and canoticism. So the contemporary theologian tried to understand the issue of the ignorance or little, little knowledge of Jesus because uh, they wanted to explain the ignorance of Jesus under the category of the Carcidian definitions. Uh, so, so let's hear about their op opinions. Uh, the historical or origins of Canoticism lie mainly within the debates generated by post Reformation, Reformation, Lutheranism, and Calvinism. Because in the sacramental context, this is my body, the words, the sentence, this is my body, Luther believed that it should be understood with a degree of literalness. It means that he wanted to. Uh, uh, understand it with a literal basis. But the uh, Calvin nor Zwingli did not accept that idea. All canonic Christologists seek to understand the incarnation by taking their cue from the Philippians, uh, chapter 2, verse 5 to 11, especially the uh, verse 10 is important. But he emptied himself, taking the form of the non on the servant and being made in the likeness of man. So the canotic means the empty pie. So they, uh, they try to understand the incarnations in the, uh, in the notion of the empty, emptying him, God himself. Uh, so mainly there is two, okay, two types of un canotic understanding. The one is the ontological canonical Christology. It, is, it can be represented as OKC. They propose that in the incarnation, the divine son gave up or laid aside. They emphasize the gave up or lay aside certain attributes or properties normally belong to the deity, thus choosing fully enter into the life of a human being and limiting himself to this experience without completely relinquishing his divine nature. So they understand that uh, maybe the omnipre omniscience, omnipresent, omnipotence, that kind of attributes Jesus Christ lay aside when he became man in, on earth. They understand like that. Uh, and the, I'll continue. <laughs> Ontological canonical Christo uh, Christology rejected the classical view that all of God's attributes are essential to him, it means Jesus. Instead, it distinguishes between essential and accidental attributes. It's very interesting. They distinguish the God's attribute as essential or something accidental. Uh, historically, Orthodox affirmed that in the tribute Omnipresence, omnipotence, and omniscience, omniscience, eternality. Yeah. <laughs> and yes, this is uh, all belong to the God, the Father, Father, Spirit, and Son. 
they should have both all of both all of them. But okay, she denied that that there be their opinions and they, they claim that son son give up his divine nature. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm a little confused. <laughs> um, okay, she denied that son give up his nature, divine nature, completely. But instead, he only gave up his some attributes. They say it's an uh, accidental attribute. But the question raises, how does one decide which attribute are which? Uh, they answered, they answered, we know only what is essential, essential to God is true in Christ. That's, that is their answer. Uh, yeah, another, another group is uh, functional account Christ, Christology. They called. They thought that the incarnation is not giving up or lay aside any of the divine attributes. Instead, the incarnated Son is fully God and continues to possess all of the divine attributes. As one who is homosexual with the Father and the Spirit, is their idea. So in the incarnation, that the divine attributes are not given up, instead they become potential or latent within the incarnated one. One present in Jesus in all their fullness, but no longer in exercise. So they, they said that all the uh, attributes are still in Jesus Christ, his body, human body. And they said the son chose to live his life completely circumscribed by his human nature and within the bound of human limitations. There is also some issues within their ideas. First, uh, they, they have a difficulty accounting for how about that the, the scripture presents the deity of the Christ in his life and ministry. The son continues to exercise his divine attribute as the son in relation to and united with the Father and the Spirit. It means that the, uh, Jesus Christ still shows his divinity and during his uh, earthly ministry. So how can they uh, explain that problem? Second, it, uh, they, over, they overemphasize the son-spirit relationship because they uh, explain that Jesus, um, how can I say that? Jesus just uh, limited his uh, potential attributes, God's attributes, but Jesus do some miracles through the power of the Holy Spirit. So they emphasize the uh, help, the supporting from the Holy Spirit. So they, so, um, they almost overemphasize the son-spirit relationship and that is not sufficient, uh, sufficient Trinitarian view. Because, yeah, so, uh, for example, uh, John 5, John chapter 5, uh, 19 to 30, uh, here we are told that Jesus can do nothing on his own initiative, but only what he, is, what he sees the Father doing. And then Jesus quickly adds, he can do everything, his part of So, um, it's, it's, it's very important, the relationship him and the other. The, the last is my conclusion. Uh, throughout the church, try to uh, explain the divinity, the conflict between uh, Jesus' humanity and divinity. And uh, our conservative try to hold uh, our traditional Christology, as I showed you the four. Uh, for example, the, uh, the Constantinople or the uh, Nicene or the Chalcedian councils, we uh, all accept that there, we all accept their, their, their resolutions there, yeah. Uh, but still, still they are not fully, uh, fully uh, revealed. I mean, still a need to be explained to show our Christianity to the world because people know, want to know the, the Christ within their uh, mindset because worldly mindset, they cannot understand the divinity of the Christ because he, he was 
even he was just, uh, man, how can he be called the divine or the God? So we tried to show them how it can be solved within our theology. So I think uh, we do not arrive the full explanation, but still we can. We have to do continue that is related to this issues. That, that was my all in presentation. Thank you. And Thank you, brother Kim. Yeah. So now it's a time for questions. Yeah. Um, so given that your uh, your presentation covered quite a range of things, yeah. and your topic was Jesus's ignorance. I want to let uh, students ask questions or share, and um, and then we'll move forward. Yeah. Any, anything from you guys? I I just had one. Uh, it's a small concern. Uh, in one of your first slides, you talk about uh, the unity of Christ. I think I think it was in the Nicaea Council, the unity of Christ, and the language that you used uh, sounds like that almost was. Um, I don't. Know, it, it's just because I'm taking this this course in philosophy yeah. also. And we're uh, taking the, these cautions to not to identify Jesus as the Father, because uh, that side sounds like modalism. Yeah. It was just like uh, I don't know, maybe change a little bit the the language you use it. I know there's a there's a, a a challenge, and it is a challenge for me also because English is not my first language. <laughs> But uh, maybe uh, just a little bit change on the language, just make clear, not give some kind of doubt about so, it. So uh, can you tell me about the language again? I'm, I'm, I'm it was in the nice when you say about the Nicaea Council, mm -hmm. I got how you how you how you wrote your your text. It sounds like they they were defending that homo uses oh, yeah. was yeah. like an identity, a uh, uh, kind of identity between the father and the son, but the, uh, the type of identity that the father is the son, and the son is the father. So that's something um, like that, and that's my just a, a small concern about this. Um. I mean, the, I think that the consubstantial, yeah. consubstantial, it means that they share the same substantials in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yes. So we can say one God. <laughs> yeah, so it is hard. I know it's hard. <laughs> I, think, I think what he, uh, yeah. what he tried uh, to say uh, was actually speaking of the Usia, yeah. or the terminology that was used during the, the council. Which is that of which something is particularly um, is the essence of something. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, so, yeah. So what what the council does say is that they share the same usia, meaning that they're uh, that each person is God in essence, not that the Father is the Son or the the Son is the Father. Um, as that's what you understand yeah, as well. Yeah. yeah. Right? Okay. Just to be fair there. Uh, so, uh, any other questions that you guys may have? Okay. Well, I would just follow up. I think, uh, mm -hmm. I think it's, it's to see your line of thinking and how you got to ignorance. Because at first I was wondering where we were going. But I think what you helped us see mm -hmm. by demonstrating, because there's really two major Christological controversies that took place. There was what was dealt with early on, more of the Arianism, uh, some of the modalism kind of stuff to identify first. Maybe highlighting his deity, even though it wasn't trying to diminish his humanity. But then, because of maybe I see it in clarification, then came some of the other councils of kind of ending with Chalcedon that then demonstrated that the, the, the both are present. Um, I think that the question I would have would be do you see the the issue that like that's dealt with more maybe in contemporary theology. Um, can, 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 I always struggle with saying the word canonicism or canonicism. canonicism. Yeah. And, and their issue or their response to this ignorance issue 
are they more focused on the fact that that there's that he's God versus human, or is there an emphasis on making a differentiation between divinity and humanity, or is there an emphasis on trying to highlight that the divinity aspect doesn't allow for ignorance or something? Does that? I guess my question would be which which earlier controversy or later controversy do you think helps us better? communicate the, the issue of ignorance and whether Jesus would be ignorant because of his human nature, so to speak, or not? Um, maybe in my opinion, just uh, I read through the books, and they try to, anyway, they try to hold both of them, the divinity and humility. So, and especially, the, my concern is that still it's very uh, confusing. I mean, the uh, nature and person is very, uh, uh, nature is not the physical words. It doesn't really represent any physical ones, so, but, but some trait, how can I say, metaphysical things. So nature person is very confusing sometimes. So, and the, the book also mentioned that the early church mentioned that the words was not the same as ours. So I had difficult to catch up those meanings, but, Anyway, in my mind, in my knowledge, within my knowledge, I try to understand that. Still, um, um, I think still, but as I said, the canonic try to uh, explain how the Jesus, even he is God, shows the ignorance. They try to explain, explain that problems. So they have to, anyway, they have to, Reduce some divinity of Jesus. Anyway, he lay down. He lay down at the highest throne, or he just uh, limited his own anything. But scripture shows that Jesus, uh, Jesus showed the miracles, and uh, not he have his knowledge, omnipotence, uh, omniscience. Yeah, he showed that. Still, what I what I want to say is that. Uh, clearly, up to now, it is not clearly explained those things clearly. They also have some short force in their opinions or in their theology. They try to explain it, but it, show, it still has some for short, I think so. But anyway, we try to go back to the, the balance, humility, <laughs> humility. That was my, was my understanding. So the, the many the councils try to come back to the, that position. So if I, if I understand you well, your conclusion from your research so far yeah. is that there is no, uh, no definite answer that would provide uh, a, enough warrant to, to hold a position uh, that will sufficiently explain the, the supposed ignorance yeah. or the ignorance of the Lord. Yeah. Um, that was my expression. I got to. Uh, and that's your conclusion. And I think, you know, I personally, I personally would agree with you um, because, see, there's been so many attempts from, from either side, but each one falls, uh, you know, they, they fall weak on a certain specific aspect. The canonic, uh, you know, um, the functional canonics, for example, they would, they would actually give a, a pretty fair explanation yeah. the fact that Jesus uh, willfully limited uh, temporarily his attributes. Therefore, while he was on earth, it would be normal that his all known knowledge or being all knowing was limited at the time. But then you find, for example, well, the book that we've all been reading, the criticism against them, you find people like, uh, you know, uh, Miller Erickson, one of the canonic, uh, functional canonicists. And he argues this, but Willem is, is very critical because, as you mentioned in your presentation, then what they're doing is that they're temporarily placing Christ uh, less than God, as if he did not continue, yeah. even through his incarnation, with the same attributes of the Father. Even, for example, he brings the argument of the cosmological implications of how Christ himself Verse uh, based on Hebrews chapter one yeah. and Colossians one is the one who sustains the universe. Therefore, 
was he not the same in the universe while he was incarnated? Uh, and remember, we talked about that uh, in one of the classes, and well, um, you know, details through it as well. And the answer is, of course, he did. And you would think, well, maybe Calvin was right with the extra that while well, he was incarnate here and he became human, in essence, because he is God. Uh, along with his attributes, he was also thrown in heaven and carrying on all of his attributes as well everywhere else, not necessarily completely uh, bottled in, into his humanity, uh, but that there was an extra that carried on with everything else. And that would explain to some degree. Uh, but then you would have to add the extra to the kinetic or functional kineticism to explain these partial ignorance. I don't think there is a particular position um, that would be that would sufficiently argue to that explanation. I think it's safe to say that there are certain things that we just don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, I, I I I I find it um, amusing that, for example. The Chalcedonian uh, Creed, the Chalcedonian Council was uh, particularly insightful uh, in the fact that they spoke of Jesus' humanity as no other council has spoken of, and they spoke of not only they carry on that notion of of, of the um, of the unity of God from uh, from the Nicene Council, but they particularly speak of the fact that he was fully human in the Chalcedonian Council, having a real uh, in a human soul, which was actually attacked previously by some of those people uh, that were, uh, you know, uh, coming out during those years. And so, but even with that, you find an issue because if you speak of the will, his human will or, or his uh, divine will, um, even with that, you can't really separate because one of the arguments, as well as Ewan brings up in the book, is, is that the incarnate Christ, the hypostatic union in Christ, if this one person who is God and men it, it cannot cease to be God, even though he is men from the moment of the incarnation. Therefore, from that point forward, even though he's fully human, he cannot just be partially God. Um, and that's where the issue lies. I think, honestly, at least from my perspective, I don't think anybody would sufficiently provide an answer to that. And it's safe to just simply say, you know what? We can dig as much as we can and as much as we want, and we'll get a lot of it. Um, but many things we won't until we meet the Lord, I guess. You know? Um, thank you, brother. I appreciate it. We have someone else online that will present uh, with us. Brother Kim, thank you very much. Sure. I, would, yeah, I would just suggest this that for your paper, uh, you focus a little bit more on how each of those views, particularly look up. Um, yeah. Uh, look at other perspectives. For example, look at the rule of predication by Martin Luther, which is also uh, it's, it's been you know and you find it in Athanasius. Uh, Wayne Grudem has an idea that would go along with that and how they deal with this. Uh, uh, look at uh, what open theists uh, say and what is their argument. Uh, that would, you know probably add some more to it and just uh, critique each position. You know, um, and particularly the, the Chalcedonian Council and how that would bring more um, more light into the whole overall subject. But if your conclusion is like mine, just simply, uh, I guess, deal more with the, the, to the topic itself as you bring all of these other aspects along. Uh, does that make sense for your paper? Thank you, Russ. All right, so. Okay. Okay. All right.